Despite massive search efforts, her body wasn't discovered for nearly two and a half months. Losing Lori has been the worst thing that's ever happened to me. You never get over it. I'm not over it now. I, I will never get over it. Hidden Truth, the Lori Hacking Case. In the summer of 2004, the police received a frantic phone call from a man who anxiously reported that his wife was missing. The man identified himself as Mark Hacking and said his wife had gone out for a jog along Memory Grove in Salt Lake, but was yet to return home. While this trip out of the house was well within his wife's routine, it was unusual for her not to return several hours after she was due at the office. His report would go on to spark a citywide search for his wife. Lori Suarez hacking, pulling numerous volunteers from across the state and gaining national attention. But as the police dug further into the case, they discovered Lori hacking buried under a pile of lies with her husband at the center of it all. Lori Suarez hacking came into this world as an orphan. She was born on December 31st, 1976, and was adopted by Thelma and Harold Suarez in April of the following year. The young couple had met in Brazil, where they volunteered as missionaries for the Latter-day Saints, and were excited to have little Lori join their family. A couple of years before, the family had adopted a son named Paul and lived an ideal life surrounded by family and friends in Fullerton, California. Unfortunately, the picturesque life they had built was not to last. In 1987, life as Lori Suarez knew it changed abruptly. Her parents decided to call their marriage quits for unknown reasons and moved on separately. But instead of moving into different houses as most divorced couples do, Thelma Suarez thought it would be better to move to a more Mormon-friendly community. So before the year ran out, Thelma and 11-year-old Lori packed their bags to Orem, Utah. While it must have been a hard decision to move with a prepubescent child over 600 miles to another state, Thelma believed that the solid Mormon community in Utah would provide better support to her as a single mother. As you can imagine, the change must have been grueling for a young Lori, especially since it meant separating from her only sibling, Paul. With graduation around the corner and a missionary path ahead, Lori's older brother had decided to stay back in California with her father. Although it must have been hard to accept, she soon adjusted to life in Orm and quickly formed a close-knit bond with her mother that would continue into her adult years. In the early 90s, Lori went on to Orem High School, where she was well-liked by her friends and classmates who described her as warm-hearted and genuine. She was also brilliant, even going ahead to serve as class president in her freshman year. On top of that, Lori was also an athlete and joined her school's baseball team. Despite her numerous activities in school, she still managed to work at a car wash in her town in a bid to put some extra money aside for college. Lori was the poster child for an all-rounder and was undoubtedly adored by many. Beautiful, with a head full of curly brown locks and with so many accomplishments on her belt, it's no surprise that Mark Hacking was drawn to her. Although neither knew they would get married when they first met or that their unity would end in tragedy, they established a relationship in high school. Considering Mark also showed athletic prowess on the field, he and Lori had much in common. It's easy to imagine them exchanging flirty banter in the halls and sharing subtle smiles between classes. Mark Hacking came from a large and religiously devout Mormon family like Lori. His parents were well respected and liked members of the community as prominent health workers. Mark's father was a pediatrician and his mother was a nurse, making them popular and able to afford a decent lifestyle for their seven children. Most of Mark's siblings followed in their parents' path and established careers in the sciences, placing a lot of pressure on Mark, who was inclined to be the class clown. Despite not being as academically inclined as some of his brothers and sisters, Mark was well-liked for his ability to make people laugh and captivate them with compelling stories. He utilized the skill well during his Mormon missions, encouraging people to convert to the Mormon faith. 
Mark's talent for storytelling stuck with him into his adult years, making him the last suspect when his wife went missing. Unfortunately, Mark's ability to influence others to accept his ideology didn't make him immune to others' influence. This is why he started to adopt a lifestyle opposite to his religious teachings on a mission trip to Winnipeg, Canada. Mark began to take on vices like smoking, drinking, and partying excessively. Appalled by his recent behavior, his mission's leader sent him home early, which would have certainly reflected poorly on his parents. However, when Mark got home, he downplayed the reason for his dismissal, passing it off as concern for a recent accident he had encountered. Despite having suspicions surrounding his story, Hacking's parents were able to help him conceal the real reason he was back home early. Perhaps in doing so, they triggered an avalanche of lying without consequences that would eventually bury Lori Hacking. When Mark got home from his mission trip in Canada, he and Lori were in a long-standing relationship, and the pair continued dating despite his momentary lapse. In the fall of 1995, Lori went to college at the University of Utah, Salt Lake, a few miles from her old high school. She continued to excel academically and made plenty of friends along the way. Still, through it all, she remained committed to her high school sweetheart, eventually marrying Mark Hacking in 1999, a year before college graduation. Now officially, Lori swore as Hacking, it seemed like life was perfect, especially considering both families liked each other. Thelma Suarez, Lori's mother, took a particular liking to Mark, and they even forged a friendship on their shared love for crossword puzzles. To many of their friends and family, the young couple seemed to be a perfect match with a bright future filled with little ones. Unfortunately, it was not meant to be. The first indicator of trouble started when Mark Hacking supposedly graduated from college. Like Lori, he had also gone to the University of Utah, but told his family he couldn't attend his graduation because he had fallen ill. While that excuse might not have raised any red flags, Mark continued to jump from one low-paying job to another. As you can imagine, this was unusual behavior for someone who supposedly had a degree in the late 90s. Of course, this meant that Lori had to carry the significant burden of providing for the young couple as a trading assistant with Wells Fargo. Despite some financial strain, Lori and Mark still presented the front of a happy couple for five more years. In July 2004, the young couple told their relatives they were expecting. And while it seemed like a dream come true for the family, as Lori and Mark were finally having a baby, it was at this time that things started to go downhill. At the time of Lori's pregnancy, Mark was employed as a psychiatric aide at the University of Utah and planned to attend medical school. Thus, the young couple was in the midst of plans to move to North California so they could be together when Mark started school, and it seemed like everything was heading in the right direction. No doubt, the optimism of what was to come was evident on Lori's face when friends saw her and her husband at a party on July 18th. Friends would later report that although Mark seemed quieter than usual, nothing seemed afoot. None of them knew it would be their last time seeing her alive. At 2.07 a.m. on July 19, 2004, police received a frantic call from Mark Hacking, reporting that his wife had been missing since morning. Forty minutes later, he called the Salt Lake Police back with an update that he had found Lori's car abandoned near a canyon on one of her usual routes. Detectives quickly arrived at the scene, but found no signs of Lori Hacking. At this point, the police began suspecting that she had been abducted. Meanwhile, family, friends, and local volunteers supported Lori's search in a citywide effort to find her. As the fantastic storyteller he was, Mark appeared on television numerous times, painting a story of his perfect life with his wife, begging for any information about her whereabouts, and pleading for her to return home. To everyone looking, Mark Hacking was utterly heartbroken at his wife's disappearance and garnered public sympathy from his community and the entire country. By the time the story captured national attention, the hunt for Lori had massive manpower behind it, but there was still no sign of the 27-year-old woman. Later on, that perception would change. A thorough house search yielded some worrying discoveries, causing the police to believe Lori's husband knew more than he was willing to say. 
One of the first things that caught their attention was that the bathtub was extremely clean and smelled like it had recently been doused with bleach. The couple's bedspread was also crispy clean like someone had bought it newly and they found Lori's purse and car keys in the house. Credit card bills would also reveal that around 5 a.m. that morning, Hacking had purchased a new mattress. The most alarming discovery they would encounter in Lori and Mark's home was a blood-stained hunting knife with specks of blood on the walls and floor. While these weren't enough to flag Mark as a suspect, detectives were starting to wonder if all was truly as it seemed. On July 20th, police responded to a call from an emergency operator reporting that Mark Hacking was running around naked, save for his sandals, near a motel. When the police arrived on the scene and confirmed the person in question was indeed Mark, they arrested him and transferred him to a psychiatric hospital. While this behavior called his sanity into question, detectives had doubts if his apparent psychotic state was real or the act of a desperate man feeling the walls closing in on him. The following day, Mark's lies started to bubble to the surface when both families were stunned to find out that he hadn't gained admission to medical school. In reality, Mark hadn't even graduated and dropped out of the University of Utah in 2002. Rather than coming clean to his family, he fabricated stories of fake classes and interviews to cover his tracks. As Hacking's charade began to crumble, investigators were able to piece together a scenario of what likely happened to Lori. Phone records revealed that on the evening of July 16th, Lori called Mark's Medical School inquiring about financial aid. Considering Mark wasn't enrolled there, she was shocked to learn the truth about her husband. It must have been disorienting for her to find out she was planning to quit her job and move to North Carolina when Mark hadn't even sent an application. Co-workers would later confirm that they saw Lori crying before the end of work, but as the couple was seemingly happy the last time they were seen together, they thought nothing of it. Still, in psychiatric holding, Mark's family encouraged him to tell the truth about his wife's whereabouts. With his house of cards wholly collapsed, on July 24th, he confessed to her murder. Mark said that on the night of July 18th, they had fought about the legitimacy of his admission to medical school, prompting him to come clean. Unhappy that his secrets had unfolded, Mark Hacking, desperate to keep his family from finding out, grabbed a 22 caliber rifle in the middle of the night and shot his pregnant wife in the head while she slept. After killing Lori, Mark cut the bloody pillowcase off with his hunting knife and dumped the evidence, the old mattress, and his wife's body in a dumpster. Investigators followed up on his claims and found Lori's decomposed body in the landfill in October 2004. Mark admitted he killed his wife and dumped her into a trash bin. It took a month of searching the Salt Lake County landfill to find Lori's remains. With no more lies left to tell, Mark pleaded guilty to the first-degree murder of his wife. In court, Mark's lies, credit card bills, and the plethora of evidence at his home made it easy to see he was the culprit. On June 6, 2005, the court sentenced Mark Hacking to six years to life behind bars, the minimum sentence in Utah. He will not be eligible for parole till 2035. Due to public outcry that Mark's sentence was too lenient, in 2006, the Utah House bill approved Lori's law, which increased the minimum penalty for first-degree murder. While this law might prevent people from getting away with a slap on the wrist for murder, it cannot reverse the tragedy of Lori Soros Hacking's murder. So there you have it. Do you think Mark Hacking got off too easy during sentencing? Do you think he should have gotten a life sentence without parole or even the death penalty? Let us know in the comments below. If you appreciated this video, make sure to like and subscribe for more true crime coverage. Thanks for watching and see you soon in the next video.